where it hits again with, with the cycles in the economy. Uh, but what's bad about this is not only the depth of the cut that hit us in May, but the fact that it came just a few years after the wave of cuts that took place in 2002 to 2004. And that had a cumulative impact. We only had a couple of years to recover from those cuts before these cuts then started. And they actually began uh, last year, not, let's say, the year before this last academic year. Uh, and then what happened in May of this year was unprecedented. And uh, we had a pretty good planning process in place uh, during January to April of 2009 for how we were going to deal with what we knew were going to be cuts to the university this year simply as a result of the economic recession. And that's the $67 million that the Chancellor referred to. And what uh, I made a deal with the deans and the department chairs. I said, I will, despite the budget cuts, privilege the curriculum, the undergraduate curriculum, by adding an additional $2 million to the money that I give you for what is called TAS support, that is say temporary academic staffing. Uh, I said, even though we're cutting in all of the categories, I'm going to bolster that category. Previously, I had given $11 million a year this, that this year I was going to give 13. But the quid pro quo was that I asked the deans and the chairs to dig deep. And they did. They were ready to dig deep in order to uh, both meet the anticipated cuts and privilege sustaining the undergraduate curriculum, meaning the number of classes, the number of discussion sections, the number of GSIs that uh, we would be able to field. We're still trying to figure out what impact May 19th has had on the curriculum. Because May 19th was when the ballot propositions went down, after which the governor said basically, I'm going to show you, the state of California, how much pain will have to be, have to be imposed if you are going to refuse to raise taxes. And the result was that our, our uh, budget cap, as a result of what he did, went up from 67 million to the vicinity of 150 million, closer to 148 million, but who's counting? Uh, when you get into those magnitudes. Now, the deans and the chairs then had to, does that mean I have three minutes left or I'm up to three minutes already? I have three minutes left. We're I have three minutes left. Okay. Sure, sure. sure. Um, we're now still tra trying to figure out whether the cuts that the deans and shares had to take as a result of what happened after May 19th was at the expense of the money that they had set aside to protect the curriculum. We're doing a census now as to how many discussion sections, how many GSIs, and so on. And then, my, I, I think we're doing pretty well this fall. My fear is that the commitments were already made for this fall back in May before this hit, and that where we're going to see the real impact is in the spring. But I'm encouraging, again, the deans and the chairs to, uh, to do everything they can to avoid that. But, you know, they, they still have to meet their cuts. So everybody is going to suffer. And that brings us to, a, to what's an interesting philosophical debate going on on campus. There are many people who say, we should show the state the blood in the streets. That's the phrase used. That basically means we should not try to minimize the impact of the cuts. We should instead try to maximize both their impact and their visibility. And that's a, you know, that's a defensible position from the standpoint of political advocacy. Whereas there are others who argue we have to do all we can to protect the students from this impact. And then the counter argument becomes, yes, and in the process the state will say, you don't need the money, you're okay, you protected the students. So, we, you know, we have hard choices to make here. With respect to political advocacy, the worst thing we can do is to shoot inward and start shooting at each other and saying it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault, or you should feel more pain, you should feel more pain, and so on. We've got to shoot outward towards Sacramento, toward the governor and the state legislature. We've got to do things at the so-called grassroots, the kind of thing that the chancellor called upon you to do to make sure you go to your district legislator's office. Make sure you, you flood your, your legislative representatives' emails with weekly protests 
Uh, where do you stand on public higher education? That's the grassroots approach. Another approach called the grass tops approach. That is, go after the heavy hitters in the state who, are, who back you see, who are willing to call their legislators and say, if you want my campaign contributions, you're not going to hurt you see in the budgetary process. And then the third approach is to go have university officials go directly to state legislators and make the case. We've got to do all those things. You've got to work on it. Staff have to work on it. Faculty have to work on it. We have to work on it at the grassroots, at the grass tops, and at the direct legislative level. Nothing short of that is going to help. We've got to all be shooting outward. Thank you very much. Um, I'm representing Harry Legrand, who's the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, who couldn't be here to see because he's in the District of Columbia at a conference that was already pre-scheduled. Harry wanted me to share a few words, and I'm also prepared to answer questions people have specifically about the ways in which the budgetary reductions will affect students outside the classroom experience. Students learn, as you know, both inside and outside the classroom you do. The principles that we have guiding how we have moved forward with the Division of Student Affairs really center around seven guiding principles, which include active learning of our students. It includes how do we help them develop ethical values around how they engage the campus community, setting high expectations for community engagement, use of systematic inquiry, how do we know that what we're doing is actually effective for our students, using our resources to the best of our ability, really partnering well with those across the campus to help us meet these reductions in a very timely and hopefully very efficient manner, and also try to maintain, which I think is one of our hardest goals, how do you do all of that while maintaining inclusion? We value these things, and sometimes our values get pushed to the limit when we have some draconian budgetary reductions. I don't think any of us could have imagined that we would have been taking a 20% reduction this time last year, and yet here we sit and here we stand. So what we're doing with regard to how we deal with these issues in student affairs, the outside the classroom experience of our students, is working very closely with those in equity and inclusion, within the administration, and within academic affairs. If you don't know, student affairs or core student services rest across four different control units. They don't all sit in the same place. And our job is to make sure that as we make budgetary reductions, we do so and do not compromise the overall <coughs> sort of experience that students have on the UC Berkeley campus. That is not a very easy job, but I think it's one that we're very committed to and one that Harry Legrand, my boss, the Vice Chancellor, is also very much committed to making happen so that students do not feel the impact uh, to a great extent as possible. Two of the things that we're working on clearly are, are, are specifically, one includes those students who live on campus, because one of the things that student affairs is responsible for is residential living, not only for students, but also for faculty and staff. And we're looking at right now, how do we maintain the status quo and not increase the residence life and the residence hall fees for next year? Recognizing that if students have to pay more fees from a tuition perspective, and they have to also pay higher fees for the cost of living, that's like a double whammy. So how can we keep those fees constant over the course of the next academic year? So Harry, my boss, is employed the Associate Vice Chancellor, which is Lenormand Strawn, to work on that very issue. The other big issue that I hear all the time as the Dean of Students, and I have the privilege of working with many of you in this room, day in and day out, usually it's always good. Um, when I'm working with you all, one of the biggest concerns you've talked to me about is how do these fee increases impact students, particularly those who come from low-income families? Um, and what will happen if the fees go up 32%? Because of the way, and the chance to talk about this a little bit, because of the way in which our financial aid system works and that we have a one-third return to aid for all of our fees, those people who have families who come from less than $60,000, their fees are covered. The bad news is that those middle class students, their fees are not. So how do we make sure that we reinvest in the Cal Grant system of this state? The other big issue, though, is will the sticker price of the campus make other people feel like, you know, I just can't go there. It's just too high, it seems too far out of my reach. And I think us in financial aid, us in this room, have to think about how do we educate people who are not familiar, all of our first generation college students who are not familiar with how the system works, how do we make sure that they understand that even though these fees have gone up, if you come from a family where your fees are below $60,000, that those fees will get covered by this institution. That, I think, is a task for myself, it is a task for financial aid, it is a task for all of us who advocate on behalf of the value of inclusion. With that, I'll stop and take questions later. Thank you.